welcome to FIRST. I'm Shirley Min along with Michelle Polston and Mark Eichmann. Changes could be coming to Delaware's environmental legacy. A revised Coastal Zone Act is up for debate and it pits the need to grow Delaware's job base versus environmentalists who feel under attack. A piece of history is back on display at Longwood Gardens. The famous fountains have undergone a massive renovation. And a group of seniors share the experience of physical activity and why it just might be a good thing to pay attention to your mind and body. First, your public media news magazine starts now. Delaware House Bill 190 has sharply divided business leaders and environmentalists in the state. Supporters say the bill makes Delaware's Coastal Zone Act more business friendly. Environmentalists warn the proposed changes gut the landmark piece of environmental legislation. We hear from both sides in this week's First Look. Delaware's Coastal Zone Act narrowly passed by one vote in 1971. The landmark legislation sealed former Governor Russell Peterson's legacy as a champion for the environment. Russ would always say, you know, they're going to come for this. And uh, I think it's just an opportune time for them to come for this because, one, he's passed, so he can't come out and defend it himself anymore. Two, we're in such economic uh, dire straits in the uh, state that they think it's prime to. And the business side has been leaning on this since 1971. Delaware Audubon President Matt Del Pizzo says businesses and state lawmakers see House Bill 190 as their chance. The Coastal Zone Act, or CZA, protects Delaware's coastal natural environment. It controls what type and where industries can develop along the Delaware River. 14 sites where heavy industry already existed pre-1971, like the DuPont Edgemore site, were allowed to continue, but many of those 14 grandfathered sites now sit shuttered or underused. The brownfields are some of Delaware's most contaminated. Newark Representative Ed Osinski is HB 190's prime sponsor. He sees job opportunities at those sites, but says the way the CZA is written, unless the new owner does the exact same thing the previous owner did or uses it for manufacturing purposes, those sites can't be used. There was really no flexibility there, and I think everybody in the business community realizes that a business that cannot adapt and be flexible, I mean, products change, industry um, activity changes, uh, there's always new technology, so you got to have that flexibility. HB 190 establishes a permitting process allowing prospective companies to bring new heavy industry to those grandfathered sites. State Senator Brian Townsend is the chief sponsor on the Senate side. It's actually strengthened the framework of the coastal zone while allowing some new kind of economic activity as part of that balancing act. Townsend says the new owner would be required to clean up the site, provide a sea level rise plan, and prove it has the money for cleanup should an accident occur. HB 190 would also allow the nine sites in the coastal zone that had docks or piers before 1971 to apply for a bulk product transfer permit. In other words, if approved, a company could move bulk goods by ship along the Delaware River, which is currently forbidden under the CZA. This worries environmentalists who say one spill could reverse gains made in the 46 years since the CZA was passed. Former Governor Peterson's widow, June, penned a letter after HB 190 was introduced in May. It reads, if alive today, Russ would be adamantly opposed to making changes to the Coastal Zone Act to allow for new heavy industry and bulk product transfer. I have no doubt that he would be in Dover lobbying for the sanctity of the Coastal Zone Act. And the reality is some of the more possible economic opportunities, the more discernible economic opportunities might involve bulk product transfer. But we're really hoping what we've done here with HB 190 will entice and attract some heavy industry. We realize that the bulk product transfer was an important part of that. Osinski believes bulk product transfer has become safer over the years and says restrictions on it hurt businesses. Our message is no one's coming. This is much to do about uh, nothing. And this is just to appease uh, the business interest 
but there is a chance that you could get a bad actor that would come in and do irreparable harm in the coastal zone. Del Pizzo says the CZA isn't keeping businesses away from Delaware. The economic decline of heavy industry overall is to blame. If companies weren't coming because of it, then they would be looking at neighboring states or border parts of the river where they could do this, where they wouldn't have to clean up a site, wouldn't have to uh, invest before they got started. So if you look up and down the river, there's zero industrial activity. There's no new sites opening. Whether companies are willing to come here, um, given the global industrial trends, we don't know. But it's not putting anything at risk to try. Del Pizzo says HB 190 risks opening up Pandora's box. The bill would only allow conversion permits for those 14 grandfathered sites. And oil refineries, steel mills, incinerators, they would continue to be forbidden under HB 190 as they have been since the CZA was enacted 46 years ago. And if no one's interested, nothing changes. Right, nothing stays. We're no worse for the wear, in other words. But Matt Del Pizzo with Delaware Audubon warns that any changes to the CZA weaken its protections and put wildlife and people who live around those industrial sites at risk. And the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control would still be in charge of, of the permitting process for these new these new operators. Right, uh, but DENREC, opponents are saying that DENREC is already failing to enforce the Coastal Zone Act laws as they are on the books, and so they're concerned about the added responsibilities that HB 190 tax on. So what does DENREC say about all that? I've emailed, I have called multiple times to DENREC, and I've really not gotten any sort of reaction. They uh, largely have not been very cooperative. And we saw this coming when Governor Carney uh, announced uh, his plans to modernize the Coastal mm -hmm. Zone back in March when he talked to the General Assembly. Right, we did, and Governor Carney then knew that this was going to be an uphill battle. That said, uh, the legislators have the numbers to pass HB 190 in spite of any of protests from environmentalists or those opposing changing the CZA at all. Del Pizzo, though, wishes that the public had been more involved on the front end before lawmakers rolled out a bill like this. All right, you'll find complete coverage of House Bill 190 and its opposition at newsworks.org slash Delaware. Thanks, Shirley. Sure. The Coastal Zone Act is just one of the items on the agenda as the legislature hurdles towards June 30th. Steve Tanzer from DelawareLiberal.net is here to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the curious thing about changing the Coastal Zone, there's a lot of emotions attached to it. Uh, of course, Russ Peterson's legacy is, is part of that emotional connection. Uh, there's also the, the environmental reform versus uh, business interests. Uh, where is all this headed? Keep in mind that the Coastal Zone really is part of Delaware's identity and has been for 40 years. I mean, people in Delaware have been proud that Delaware had the foresight to try to protect some of its most vulnerable areas uh, with legislation that would hopefully forestall spills, environmental disasters, and what have you. So that's been a history over 40 years. Um, what we have now, of course, is uh, moves to change the coastal zone. And, and I think the primary controversy seems to revolve around what they call bulk transfer, which essentially is either trains bring in or take out hazardous materials, they unload them and load them. And so that's really the controversy, whether or not under the new Coastal Zone Act uh, is going to get to the point where some of those uh, environmental protections are really threatened. The other controversy with the bill, and this, where does it go from here? Good question because the bill was introduced at the end of May. And the very first opportunity, the first legislative uh, committee hearing in June after they came back, uh, they considered it. The question is, are they going to try to fast track this bill before the end of June or not? I think that, that would be a huge mistake. You're going to try to change 40 years of a legacy right. in that period of time in a bill that really a lot of people don't understand exactly what's in it, especially when you already have some uh, precedent. You've seen what happens at IPC or whatever they call that oil refinery this week with the bulk transfers that they were doing in violation of the law but didn't bother to tell anybody. Right. So you end up with businesses that are almost too big to fail because of the jobs it offers. Right. So that's a lot of what the controversy is. I would hope they would wait, have the bill considered in public hearings throughout the state during the break. And a lot of other things uh, are going to take up a lot of the oxygen. Uh, yes. and w one of those things, of course, the budget and uh, final defect numbers are out next week. Do you think uh, there's, there's some sort of magic nugget out there that sometimes uh, uh, appears in June? Not this year. You're talking a $400 million deficit. I mean, even if they magically find another 25 mil somewhere, right. 
which seems less likely now that there are fewer real revenue sources available to the state. No, it's just going to be a real has, hash out to get this, this budget finalized, especially now that you have the Republicans tying any support for different budgetary uh, revenue enhancers to things like uh, rolling back prevailing wage and cutting back on Medicare, Medicaid uh, uh, provisions as well. Uh, and, and there's also been uh, some discussion uh, about minimum wage as well, uh, increasing the minimum wage. Uh, and, and that bill was, was tabled earlier in the week and then uh, brought back up, uh, I, I think, back on the agenda late this week. Uh, Maybe. It was supposed to be uh, heard on Tuesday. It was not considered on Tuesday. Uh, so I don't know what's happening. I do know this, though, that the Democratic Party's platform, State of Delaware, provides for 15, uh, supports a $15 minimum wage. This minimum wage bill over the course of four years would raise Delaware's minimum wage to $10.25. It will pass if all Democrats support it, <laughs> which is <laughs> a, 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 big a bigger if. if yeah, yes. right. Uh, and it is always fascinating uh, what lawmakers decide is, is a priority. And I think a lot of people probably didn't know that Delaware never had an official abortion law, and, and now the state does. Uh, why was that important to do uh, this session? Well, it was important. Uh, Delaware did have an abortion law. However, when Roe v. Wade became the law of the land back in, I think, 1973, that superseded Delaware's law, okay. which, which supporters of, of a woman's reproductive rights uh, would view as very draconian. If Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, and that's what the fear is, that if uh, Trump is able to get one word judge on the Supreme Court to maybe replace someone who has supported Roe v. Wade, that law would go by the books. Absent doing this, you would have had a very draconian statute on the Delaware books. This essentially codifies the um, protections in Roe v. Wade as Delaware law. Separate from the federal law. Well, I mean, right now, well, the law is Roe v. Wade. Right. Separate, but, but if that is reverted oh, to the right. states, then state law would take precedence. And Delaware's statute was very draconian. Okay. Now, and, now it isn't. And uh, as we wrap up here, uh, I'm sure we'll, in, a, in a couple of weeks, we'll have a better answer to this question. But uh, at the, as we come to the end of the legislation, at his legislative session, if you had to give Governor Carney uh, a, a grade, it's a, his report card time, where, where does he stand? Right now, at best, a D, because he, of the, he really hasn't gotten involved. The lack of leadership and the lack of vision, even on the budget issue. I, I was reading the, the article in the paper. He's like, well, I hope they get together and resolve this. The governor's office traditionally has always been deeply involved in these negotiations. Other than setting up that sort of mathematical formula of, I want 50% in revenue enhancers, 50% in, in cuts, I have not seen that leadership. So at best to D, only a D because he says he supports minimum wage increase. <laughs> all right, we'll see how it all turns out. Uh, Steve Tanzer, DelawareLiberal.net, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Take care. Coming up on First, some reflections of a Delaware Today writer and her encounter with South African social rights leader Bishop Desmond Tutu. And this group loves to play racquetball. Consider them an inspiration or just people who love the game. Either way, check out First Experience. Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square is known for many things. The fountains on the ground is one of them. They first went online in 1931 and have worked the same way for 83 years. But at some point, old plumbing needs repair. But the old pipes were too good to throw out. Now a major overhaul has taken place. And Peter Crimmings from the Arts and Culture Desk at WHYY FM is here. Hi, Peter. Hi, Michelle. It costs $90 million, and what you get is a 21st century fountain. It required digging a quarter mile of maintenance tunnels. Every stone pool and sculpture was upgraded. That translates to over 4,000 pieces of limestone. But what you get is pretty impressive, and it maintains the original vision of its creator, Pierre Dupont. Pierre Dupont not only ran the vast Dupont Chemical Company and managed the family fortune in the early 20th century, he also had an eye for classical European landscaping. He designed the sprawling Longwood Gardens himself, including its centerpiece water garden. This is an engineer's garden, and that's how we often refer to it. And our fountain garden was his culminating work. Everything that he did here at Longwood was building up to this garden. 
the five acre garden has 380 fountain jets, over 700 lights, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. 90% of this operation is underground in a network of newly dug concrete tunnels large enough to drive a truck through. There's an extensive system of um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. For example, we have almost 400,000 gallons of water that are stored in two separate locations and underground pump houses. And those underground water storage tanks are providing all the water for the experience here. A fountain garden this size requires a lot of maintenance. Every time a pipe would spring a leak, workers had to dig up the garden to find the pipe, patch it up, and then replant on top of it. Due to maintenance issues, the south wall was shut down entirely 30 years ago. Water has not flowed here since the 1980s. Three years ago, Longwood Gardens began a complete overhaul of the fountain garden to bring in state-of-the-art technology and to give workers underground access. Now, when you see our beautiful fountains and one of the octagons, um, you can imagine that one of our talented maintenance people can actually go underneath that octagon to do repairs and to take care of it, and our guests will never ever know what's happening. The system is now outfitted with new pumps, a new water reservoir, new fountain jets, but Redmond saved all the original equipment. This is the, the pump house. These are all the original pumps, and look how beautiful they are. These 18 pumps are still bolted to the ground where they push 10,000 gallons a minute into the fountain garden for more than 80 years. The original air compressors, the workhorses of the fountain garden, to, they look like old steam engines, don't they, for a, for a train, a locomotive. This is now a museum to show that underneath Pierre Dupont's classical European sensibility hummed the mind of an engineer. When Mr. Dupont designed this, he designed the original fountain garden with redundancy. So there were multiple systems of pipes. And he knew that over time he would lose pipes. So by the time we closed the garden down in 2014, we were down to one pipe. There have been radical improvements to the DuPont design. Now the fountain shows are controlled by computer. Some of the jets spit fire as well as water. And the underground water tanks allow the fountain to perform more often, even in winter. Nevertheless, Redmond says he's honoring the legacy of the garden's designer, Pierre Dupont. I have no doubt that if he were standing on the overlook, looking at this garden right now, it would look the same to him. He would know this garden. But we also know that if he were here today and he was faced with having to bring new life to this garden, that he would look to the future and that he would be looking at the latest and greatest technology. And that's exactly what we did. There are three shows daily for the fountains. There's also a July 2nd fireworks spectacular planned at Longwood Garden. Everything looks amazing, Peter. Any way to determine how visitors like the new look? The layout is almost exactly the same. The performances of the fountains when they are synced to music and lights is more impressive than ever. But I spoke to one local woman. She brings her kids to the garden almost every week. She has three boys. And she said they enjoyed watching bulldozers pushing tons of dirt around, more so than the elegant flowers and water spouts. Okay, well, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, you can find Peter's work as part of the Arts and Culture Desk on WHYY FM 90.9. First is the type of show where if you miss a moment, you'd miss a lot. That's why we invite you to check out whyy.org slash first. This show and all of our past broadcasts live there online. Check it out. First continues to look for ways on how we can keep our courageous conversation race removing fences between black and white communities moving forward. As part of our content partnership with Delaware Today Magazine, we're going to bring in writer Cynthia Primo Martin. She is the daughter of the Right Reverend Quinto Primo Jr., who was the first African-American bishop elected in Chicago and Delaware. Her story about the time she spent with Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu appears in June's Delaware Today magazine. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So tell us, you wrote that Archbishop Tutu reminds you of your family because of his commitment to social justice issues. Can you give us an example when you compare him to your father? Yeah, uh, they were very wise people, both of them, and okay. uh, they were willing to fight for whatever was right and not worried about um, their own personal uh, mm -hmm. safety. 
uh, and, and there were many times, certainly like Bishop Tutu, that my father uh, saw discrimination, uh, had it happened to him, even as a bishop in Chicago. Uh, he had uh, people at a confirmation class uh, say that they would not be touched by a black bishop when they were to be confirmed. So it, it, to turn the other cheek is very tough, but he, both he and Bishop Tutu would turn the other cheek and move forward. So let's talk about today's time. Uh, what's your reaction when it comes to the, the what's your reaction when coming from a legacy of just social justice when it comes to like, how do you think about, or what do you think about today's racial and social justice issues? Well, I think certainly everyone would agree we have come a little bit of the way, uh, but I worry now that we are backtracking. Um, there have been significant uh, accomplishments, but there are so many more um, issues that have arisen, and part of it is because I think people do not respect each other. People are do, do not um, act in dignified way ways. We're 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 very quick. Um, to want to only deal with what's our issue. It's all about me. And, and it's not about people who may be poor or maybe um, have, have uh, um, significant issues in, in, in the workplace, uh, don't have adequate housing and so on. And I, I think we have come, come some way, but okay. we have a long way to go to be equal. Okay, now do you think the reason why so many people are, are acting uh, in, in undignified ways is because of our current president? Because you mentioned even in your article when you, when you met with Archbishop Tutu that he had a, he kept it brief when it came to describing our president. Yeah. Well, I'm not a Trump supporter. I never was <laughs> to begin with, but I think it's not only him, but it's just the whole uh, uh, attitude of people. And I think I hate to say that some of it is related to our culture of cultural drugs, of, of guns, and so on. And I just, I just think that we're out of control as, as a culture, um, and, and, and that uh, not having um, leadership that um, steers us in a, in a way that's good for all is an issue. So WHYY recently teamed up with the Christina Cultural Arts Center to hold a forum on race to discuss a, a number of different issues. What do you think is needed outside of uh, community conversations? I think we have to individually search our, our own selves. And, um, and as in, there still needs to be what they call um, uh, behavior modification. We have to watch what we say and do. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that that person we're talking to is an individual. And I think we can talk about it as a community, mm -hmm. but individually we have to take responsibility for it. And, and we have to make sure our families understand that everyone is to be respected. Okay, well thank you so much, Cynthia Primo Martin. Uh, first, if you wanna take a look at Cynthia's story, it's also online at DelawareToday.com. A special presentation of race, removing fences between black and white communities will air on July 2nd. <laughs> Earlier this month, athletes from across the country descended on Birmingham, Alabama for the 30th anniversary of the National Senior Games. Among the athletes competing for medals was a group of Delawareans from Sussex County who competed in racquetball. First Experience visited with the group of five as they trained for the Games. I'm Douglas Winkleman. I'm 77 years old. My name is Barbara Pichetti, nicknamed Doc or Doctor. I am 64 years old. I'm Terry Rock, and I'm 72 years old. I'm Pat McGuire. I'm 70. My name is Ingrid Coleman. I am 61 years old. There's a group of five of us from Southern Delaware uh, that are going to be going to the National Senior Olympics for racquetball. We had to, to begin with, at least placed within the first four positions in our regional Olympics. Now we're qualified to play in the National Senior Olympics. I've been in five different Olympics. Last one in Cleveland. I got a gold in women's doubles. 
a gold in mixed doubles and a silver in women's singles. It was the age level of women 60 plus. I played in 1989 in the Senior Olympics when I won the gold. And after that, when I came back, I was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. This was an incentive for me to get well again, and um, I did. It's a great challenge, and it challenges myself, you know, and it challenged me to stay well, uh, to stay active. Uh, it, it's just a great feeling. I started playing in the Senior Olympics 10 years ago. It's just a fun way to play age group racquetball. When I moved here, I saw Terry and Barb just moved here too. They took me under their wing and they showed me so much. So that was like two years ago. And in the meantime, I've played in, uh, I want to say three major tournaments. In October, I qualified in the state, Delaware State Olympics. I'm like, okay, now we can go to the, you know, National Senior Olympics. So I'm playing in three different uh, events. I'm gonna be a busy girl. I'm playing in uh, mixed doubles, women's doubles, and uh, women's singles. You can get an incredible amount of exercise, something approaching 800 calories an hour. I play three or four times a week. I feel much better because I'm out here exercising three or four times a week. We are not age limited. We enjoy the game. We also enjoy the camaraderie. We know each other well, and we just enjoy each other's company. It's the camaraderie. It's also staying healthy. I feel good about myself. I feel good about the people I play with. It's just, it's really a great, great fun. I just like the competition, and I love the camaraderie. I love the interaction that everybody has. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's a big deal, but it's more for the enjoyment of the game than anything else. You can sit and watch sports all you want on television, but once you participate, that's a whole other ball game. I don't know, once you get that blood flowing and the adrenaline rush, it's just a lot of fun. Get out and play. You don't get old because you're playing, you get old because you stop playing. There was a total of 220 racquetball players from across the country. There were even two men competing in the 90 to 94 age bracket. The Delaware group won a total of six gold and two silver medals. And here is the team posing with their medals. Congratulations to them. The group is taking what they learned and they're already working towards the 2019 games in Albuquerque. So good luck. And our thanks to Midway Fitness and Racquetball in Rehoboth Beach for accommodating us for this story. Yeah, uh, next week on First, there's a new sheriff in charge of the bee population in the state of Delaware. Didn't know that such a person exists? Then find out what she does on the next First. Yep, that is First for this week, though. We thank you for watching. For Peter Crimmins, Mark Eichmann, and Nichelle Polston, I'm Shirley Min. Have a great week.